The Apocalypse tells us that the end times beast empire is both one, a beast out of the sea, and two, a beast that was and is not. The term beast out of the sea points us to the book of Daniel, where we learn that beasts out of the sea are empires on the Mediterranean Sea. From the description in Apocalypse 13.1 that a beast out of the sea will arise, St. John is telling us that the last days will feature a new empire that arises on the Mediterranean Sea. Yet this new godless empire will be a beast that was and is not. Apocalypse 17.8, quote, The beast which thou sawest was and is not, and shall come up, end quote. The beast was and is not, because it's a new version of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the beast on the sea in St. John's day, the anti-Christian European-centered empire on the Mediterranean Sea, which persecuted the church. But the Roman Empire beast eventually broke up and was supplanted by Christian Europe. The fact that St. John's description pertains to an empire on the Mediterranean Sea is further confirmed by the fact that St. John saw his vision on the island of Patmos, which is in the Mediterranean Sea. And he wrote the Apocalypse to the seven churches of Asia, which were part of the Roman Empire on the Mediterranean Sea. The saga that St. John describes is clearly one which applies directly to Europe and to the area previously occupied by the Roman Empire. St. John sees that in the last days, pagan and anti-Christian Europe, which was originally characterized by the pagan Roman Empire, but then supplanted by Christian Europe, will return. It will return in the form of a new and updated Roman Empire. This new empire slash beast will occupy essentially the same territory that the Roman Empire occupied. Daniel chapter 7 described the territory of the Roman Empire beast as ten horns. In Apocalypse 13.1, the end times beast out of the sea is also said to have those ten horns, precisely because it occupies the same general territory as the Roman Empire. Like the Roman Empire, it's a European empire on the Mediterranean Sea. This new European empire on the Mediterranean, the beast out of the sea that arises in the last days, is the European Union. We are also told that the end times beast out of the sea has seven heads. We read in Apocalypse 17 that the seven heads are seven mountains, meaning Rome, and they are seven kings. We are thus informed that the seven heads are seven kings of Rome. For large periods of Christian history, the popes, who ruled from Rome, were temporal kings of the papal states. In the year 1870, however, the popes lost their temporal kingship when Italy declared war on the papal states. Rome was annexed to the Kingdom of Italy, and at that point, the popes were devoid of a temporal kingship. However, on February 11, 1929, a brand new agreement was forged between Italy and the Holy See. It was called the Lateran Treaty. This agreement created the Vatican city-state, and it gave the claimants to the papacy an entirely new temporal kingship. The treaty even stipulated that it was a new arrangement, not a continuation of the papal states. Starting on February 11, 1929, there were thus brand new kings in Rome. It is therefore an indisputable fact of history that Pope Pius XI was the first in a new line of Roman kings. Pope Pius XII was the second king, anti-Pope John XXIII, the third king, Paul VI, the fourth king, John Paul I, the fifth king, John Paul II, the sixth king, and Benedict XVI, the seventh king. Stunningly, Apocalypse 17.10 tells us that the beast out of the sea the empire on the Mediterranean, comes into existence during the reign of the sixth king, when five of the kings are fallen. That would mean that the beast out of the sea, the new empire on the Mediterranean Sea in the last days, should be formed during the reign of John Paul II, the sixth king. And that is exactly what happened. The European Union, which we contend is the beast out of the sea, came into existence with the implementation of the Maastricht Treaty in 1993, during the reign of John Paul II, the sixth king, when five of the kings were fallen. The Apocalypse also tells us that one of the seven kings is wounded, and his image is subsequently honored. That fits precisely with the wounding of John Paul II and the honor given to his image. That king who is wounded is also said to be the beast. The Apocalypse also tells us that the seventh king will reign for only a short time. Apocalypse 17.10, quote, And when he is come, he must remain a short time. End quote. That would mean that Benedict XVI, if he was the seventh king, as we believe, should have had a short reign, and that is exactly what happened. His reign only lasted seven years. Benedict XVI's stunning decision to renounce or resign his position to end his reign prematurely was also arguably a signal of the abruptness or shortness of his reign. 
It's also fascinating that Benedict XVI announced his resignation on February 11, 2013. February 11th was the date on which the Lateran Treaty was signed in 1929. So the first king, Pius XI, received his kingship on February 11th, and Benedict XVI, the last of the seven kings, announces the end to his reign on February 11th. Moreover, just a few hours after Benedict XVI's shocking announcement on February 11th, 2013, that he would renounce his, quote, office, which dominated the headlines that day, Lightning struck the top of St. Peter's Basilica twice in an obvious sign from God. Even mainstream media outlets were wondering what this lightning strike might mean. Well, in our video Why Lightning Struck the Vatican, which was published before Bergoglio's quote election, we stated our position that the lightning strikes were a signal that the period of the Seven Kings is now over. The lightning at the top of St. Peter's Basilica on February 11, 2013, captured for the whole world to see, just hours after Benedict XVI's stunning announcement, was, we stated, a signal that the period of the Seven Kings, which began on a February 11th in 1929, with the signing of the Lateran Treaty, ended essentially on a February 11th of 2013, with the shocking resignation of the seventh and final king. And what has occurred since then constitutes a striking fulfillment of that point. So what about anti-Pope Francis, the new claimant to the papacy? Our material proves that Jorge Bergoglio, the man called Pope Francis, is a manifest heretic. He denies many Catholic teachings. He accepts false religions, celebrates Jewish holidays, holds that Protestants and schismatics are in the church, and much more. According to Catholic teaching, he's a heretic and he cannot be a valid pope, just as the previous Vatican II claimants to the papacy beginning with John XXIII were not valid popes. But how does anti-Pope Francis fit in with the Seven Kings? There are some very interesting points we need to consider. The beast, that is the empire on the Mediterranean Sea, is said to only have seven heads. According to Apocalypse 17.11, the beast itself is the eighth king. There are a number of reasons why Antipope Francis is not the eighth king. There were only seven kings, and the eighth king is the beast itself, that is to say the European Union, for the reasons I will explain. First, Antipope Francis, Jorge Bergoglio, is not only a heretic and an antipope, as Benedict XVI, John Paul II, etc. were, but he's also not even a validly ordained priest. Bergoglio was ordained in the new rite of ordination on December 13, 1969. He is the first and only one of the recent claimants to the papacy, who was not ordained a priest in the traditional Catholic rite of ordination. He was, quote, ordained in Paul VI's new modernized, Protestantized rite, which right is invalid for the very same reasons the Anglican right of ordination was declared invalid by Pope Leo XIII in his 1896 bull Apostolice Curie. We have a video on that topic. Benedict XVI, on the other hand, while he was a heretic and an anti-pope according to Catholic teaching, and he was not a bishop because he was made a bishop in the new modernized right which is invalid, he was nevertheless a priest having been ordained in 1951 in the traditional Catholic right of ordination. So, all of the seven kings, beginning with the Lateran Treaty, were priests, but Jorge Bergoglio, anti-Pope Francis, is just a layman. He is the only recent claimant to have been ordained in the new modernist rite. He is therefore unique in that regard. Why is this significant to the matter of the seven kings? It's crucial, because the Vatican city-state is, guess what, classified as a sacerdotal, monarchical state. Sacerdos is the Latin word for priest. A sacerdotal monarchy is a priest kingdom. Here are just a few quotes identifying the Vatican city-state under the Lateran Treaty as a sacerdotal monarchy. There are many other quotes. G. Pope Atkins, Encyclopedia of the Inter-American System, page 219, quote, Thus, the Holy See has legal personality in international law, with the Pope presiding over a sacerdotal monarchy, end quote. Another quote, Vatican City Business Law Handbook, page 54, quote, the Vatican city-state, an enclave of Rome, and a sovereign monarchical sacerdotal state, end quote. And these are not just after-the-fact interpretations. The Lateran Treaty itself speaks of an agreement concerning and with ecclesiastics, that is, priests and those in holy orders. Bergoglio is not a priest. He doesn't have valid orders. He is not and cannot be a king of the priest monarchy. That's why he's not the eighth king. And this truth becomes more interesting and strikingly more apparent when we consider not only what Bergoglio, anti-Pope Francis, is currently doing, but the fascinating parallels to the dissolution of the Great Red Dragon. 
Apocalypse 12.3 speaks of the Great Red Dragon. The Great Red Dragon was clearly the Soviet Union, the Red Communist Empire of Russia. Apocalypse 12 indicates that this Great Red Dragon comes on the scene immediately after the woman clothed with the sun and the sign of heaven. The event at Fatima was the woman clothed with the sun and the sign of heaven, and the great miracle of Fatima occurred on October 13, 1917. A secular newspaper of the time even unknowingly described that miracle as the sign of heaven, which is precisely how the sign is described in Apocalypse 12.1. So just as the great red dragon followed the woman clothed with the sun in the prophecy given to us in Apocalypse 12, in actual history the same thing occurred. The Russian Revolution, which eventually formed the Great Red Dragon or Empire, happened just weeks after the miracle of Fatima. The Great Red Dragon thus followed on the heels of the woman clothed with the sun. History indeed corresponds to prophecy. This is significant to our discussion for a number of reasons, but simply allow that a comparison can be made between the seven heads of the beast and the Great Red Dragon. Now, the Great Red Dragon, the Communist Soviet Union, officially broke up and dissolved in essentially a two-stage process in 1991. This is very interesting. The Soviet Union officially dissolved on December 8, 1991, and it was exactly 17 days later, on December 25, 1991, that Mikhail Gorbachev resigned his office as president of the Soviet Union and declared the office extinct. Let me repeat that. The resignation of the office the evacuation of the office of President of the Great Red Dragon occurred exactly 17 days after the announcement of the dissolution. Isn't it interesting that Benedict XVI, the last of the Seven Kings, officially resigned his office on February 28, 2013, exactly 17 days after he announced the end of his reign on February 11, 2013? For it was on February 11 that he shocked the world, declaring that he would be dissolving or ending his reign and he said that it would take effect, that is, that he would officially vacate his office, exactly 17 days later, on February 28th. The parallel is striking, and it's not just a coincidence. In both cases, the leader vacated the office exactly 17 days after the announcement. This is actually frightening for those who wrongly believe that the current sect in Rome, the Vatican II sect, represents the true Catholic Church, when it does not. It's a counter-church. They should be frightened because Gorbachev's resignation and evacuation of the office 17 days after the announcement also represented the extinction of the office. The office was declared extinct and it would never exist again. Hence, if we carry the parallel forward, it would follow that when Benedict XVI resigned his office 17 days after the announcement, his position would not only be vacant, but extinct. The position he held the office in which he sat, would never exist again. And the office we're talking about is not the papal office, not the office of St. Peter, for anti-Pope Benedict XVI, being a heretic, never sat in the true papal office. But the office we're talking about is the office of priest-king of the Vatican city-state. Benedict XVI's resignation, and in fact renunciation of the office, 17 days after the announcement, meant that there would never be another priest-king of the Vatican city-state, just as there would never be another president of the Soviet Union. That's why lightning struck the Vatican twice. It was a signal that the office is now extinct, and what do we see? The next man in line, Jorge Bergoglio, is not even a priest. Since he's not a sacerdos, he does not and cannot sit in the office of priest-king of the sacerdotal monarchy. It's extinct. Instead, he's simply a lay leader, and this represents the final punishment, the new reality, the culmination of the apostasy, the ultimate mockery of the priesthood, the church, and the authority Christ established. And this new reality, that he is simply a lay leader of a new entity, is directly manifesting itself in the actions of this lay leader. Bergoglio, under the pretense of humility, openly shuns universal papal authority, and specifically all aspects of kingship, God allows Bergoglio to do this as an indication that he's not one of the kings, since he's not even a priest. Many commentators have noticed that Bergoglio has immediately embarked upon a revolutionary new style of leadership, a shocking desacralization of the office. But they don't realize what's really going on. Among other things, Bergoglio has refused to be crowned. He has rejected the papal throne. And he even eschews the elevated platform reserved for popes, Here's a news clip that was posted on YouTube. When it comes to small details, Pope Francis has already made some changes. 
His open attitude is obvious, but there are other things that may be overlooked by many. For example, the Pope has used this white chair instead of the traditional throne seat. In his other meetings with religious leaders and diplomats, Pope Francis used the simple white chair, which is usually reserved for weekly general audiences. Another point is that the chair is not elevated on a platform. Rather, it's kept at the same level and height as other seats. In fact, during his meeting with religious leaders, he used the same type of chair as the guest. Bergoglio's actions are a sign of the new reality, the new lay church, and that he is not one of the priest kings. In fact, a BBC report concerning Francis's actions shortly after his quote election contains an amazing and stunning confirmation of this point. After Bergoglio was quote elected, he rejected the red cape known as the Mosetta, which signifies a pope's hierarchical rank. The BBC reported that he did so in these words, quote, No thank you, Monsignore, Francis is reported to have replied. You put it on instead. Carnival time is over. The BBC comments, It was just one small sign out of many this week that as Massimo Franco, one of Italy's shrewdest political editorial writers, commented, The era of the Pope King and of the Vatican Court is over. End quote. Wow. Let me repeat that. The era of the Pope King and of the Vatican Court is over. What an amazing confirmation of the point we've been covering, and specifically of the point we mentioned in the video, why lightning struck the Vatican, which was put out before Bergoglio's quote election. In that video, it is stated that we believe that Benedict XVI's decision to renounce the office on February 11th, in accordance with the lightning strike on the same day, signified the end of the period of the kings. And now we see even a mainstream secular media source, such as the BBC, admitting that the era of the Pope King or Priest King is over. The BBC report goes on to say, quote, You only had to look at the shocked faces of many of the courtiers when they suddenly realized the significance of what had happened and understood that it really was over. End quote. One could hardly ask for a better confirmation of the point that Bergoglio represents the period after the priest kings? Bergoglio embodies the tragic culmination of the Vatican II sect, the counter-church in Rome. What they've been left with, after all of their apostasy and a series of antipopes, is not just a counter-church which is devoid of the true Catholic faith and leading people astray, but a lay structure headed by a non-priest. This is God's just punishment for the adherence of the Vatican II sect. This is also another striking confirmation that the new rite of ordination is absolutely and totally invalid. In God's sight, those elevated in it are no different from laymen. It is worthless. In addition to rejecting the papal crown, rejecting the papal throne, rejecting the elevated papal platform, here are some other actions of Bergoglio, anti-Pope Francis, which signify exactly what we're discussing, that he's not one of the seven kings, that he's not a pope, that he's not someone who even claims universal ruling authority, and that he's just the lay leader of a new entity. His first act from the balcony of St. Peter's was to ask the lay people, including non-Catholics, to, quote, bless him, removing the distinction between the uniqueness of the priestly character and the lay people who lack it, and indicating that he's just one of them. He did not start by using the customary praised be Jesus Christ or dear brothers and sisters, but employed a much more familiar and inviting good evening in Italian to address the drenched crowds. According to even the Novus Ordo rite, the man elected is supposed to sit on the throne, and the cardinals are supposed to show obedience. Francis rejected the throne and just shook hands with them. Quote, he accepted the congratulations of cardinals not seated on a traditional throne-like chair, but standing up and greeting them one by one. End quote. Francis has also chosen not to live in the papal apartment, but to live in a guest house instead. As mentioned earlier, Francis also rejected the red elbow-length cape known as the Mosetta, which signifies a pope's hierarchical rank. It was left hanging in the wardrobe of tears. To Vatican officials who offered him an elaborate gold pectoral cross to wear around the neck, he said he'd prefer to keep his very simple cross that he's worn as a bishop. Regolio anti-pope Francis also doesn't travel in the car reserved for the Vatican head of state, but in regular cars with others. Quote, Francis shunned the official Vatican state car that had been prepared for him. Bergoglio also emphasizes that he's merely the Bishop of Rome, in the sense that he's just a local leader rather than head of the universal church. According to Catholic teaching, a true Bishop of Rome has universal authority as successor of St. Peter, 
but Bergoglio's use and emphasis of the title Bishop of Rome implies that he's just a local leader rather than one possessing universal authority. Quote, it was striking that in his initial appearances, he repeatedly referred to himself as the Bishop of Rome, rather than emphasizing his role as an authority figure in the universal church. As one, quote, orthodox schismatic said, that's how we see him, as the Bishop of Rome. That the Pope repeatedly referred to himself that way is music to our ears, end quote. Bergoglio also celebrated his first official service in the Vatican's parish church, implying again that he's merely a local rather than a universal leader. Quote, Notable that Francis sang first mass in St. Anne, the Vatican's parish church, and gave a brief extemporaneous homily like a simple parish priest, end quote, John Allen Jr. Shortly after his, quote, election, Bergoglio also shocked people by showing up at the hotel to pay the bill himself, as if his elevation to the, quote, papacy was just a regular day of work, just like getting a new secular job that should not prevent him from running errands after closing time, just like everyone else does. A few days after his, quote, election, Francis also met with the so-called Jesuit superior Adolfo Nicholas. Nicholas mentioned that Francis, quote, insisted that I treat him like any other Jesuit, so I did not have to worry about treatments, holiness, or holy father, end quote. And there are many other examples. The point is that while everyone can see that what he's doing is new and strange, that it's revolutionary even for the Vatican II antipopes, most attribute it to his pretension to humility, when in fact it's God's way of manifesting that he's not even a priest, he's not the Pope, and he's not one of the kings. He's the leader of the new lay reality. In fact, in 2014, Antipope Francis once again surprised the world with his decision to opt for a typical Argentinian passport rather than the Vatican's diplomatic passport used by the previous kings of the Vatican city-state. Here are some quotes from the article. Francis will travel the world with his Argentinian passport and not use a Vatican diplomatic one. He completed the procedure for a new passport and a new ID card as any ordinary citizen of the country would. Francis thus continues to astound the world by acting in a very normal way. It is but the latest instance of what in Rome has become known as the scandal of normality. Francis explicitly asked that he enjoy no privilege and so the new ID card and passport have followed the normal administrative path. The minister revealed that Francis carried out the procedure like all Argentinians do, where a digital photo is taken together with fingerprint and signature, all in 15 minutes, end quote. Francis also paid the fee for the passport, like everyone else. That means that Francis officially does not travel as head of the Vatican city-state. It's another powerful confirmation that he's not one of the kings. In fact, if we elaborate on the analogy between the demise of the Great Red Dragon and the demise of the Seven Kings, it's somewhat interesting to note that the system which replaced the Great Red Dragon in Russia itself, following the dissolution of the Soviet Union, was called the Commonwealth of Independent States, or the CIS. The official establishment of the CIS is considered to be December 21, 1991, when 11 former Soviet republics officially came together in the CIS. This new leadership of the CIS, representing the new system, was formed on December 21, 1991, exactly 13 days after the Soviet Union dissolved on December 8, 1991, and 13 days after the creation agreement for the CIS was formed. So, 13 days after the announcement of the dissolution of the Great Red Dragon, a new system in Russia had its new leadership. Isn't it interesting that Benedict XVI, the last of the seven priest kings, officially left office in the evening of February 28, 2013, and exactly 13 days later, on March 13, 2013, the new system in Rome, a non-priest king system, elected its new leader, Jorge Bergoglio, a layman posing as a priest. I don't think that's just a coincidence either. It's another signal that just as the Great Red Dragon dissolved and a new system replaced it in Russia 13 days later, the position of priest king in Rome also dissolved and a new system with a new leader, a layman, replaced it 13 days later. And it's fascinating to consider how this fits with the prophecy of the beast, the empire, the secular authority, itself being the eighth king. In Apocalypse 17.3, St. John gives us a description of the beast, the empire on the Mediterranean, as a woman sitting on a beast, adorned with precious stones and pearls, etc. His description fits precisely with the woman Europa in Greek mythology, a figure depicted even before the time of Christ as sitting on a beast and adorned with pearls, etc. Europa is the name from which we get Europe, 
the stunning correspondence between St. John's description of the woman on the beast and Europa, the woman from Greek mythology, clearly indicates that the European Union is the beast out of the sea. Or, to speak more precisely, Europe itself is the beast in its political and religious dimensions. St. John is telling the story of Europe in its secular, political dimension and in its religious one. Now, consider that one aspect of the distinction between the beast and the seven heads, which are said to be attached to the beast, is that the beast, the empire, when distinguished from the seven kings or heads, represents primarily the political aspect of Europa, the woman. The seven heads in Rome, on the other hand, the seven Roman kings, represent primarily the spiritual or priestly leadership of Europa, as well as the spiritual transformation that occurs in Europa as a result of their actions. There are thus two facets to Europa, the woman on the beast, just as there are two facets to other empires or societies. There is a political aspect and a religious one. That's why, by the way, the mark of the beast which Europa gives to its inhabitants has two components. There is a physical mark on the currency, without which no one can buy or sell, and a spiritual mark on the hand or head, the new sacramental system in Europa given by the priest kings. This physical mark has been fulfilled in the euro, the currency of the European Union. The mark of the empire, the map of the union, that is the beast, is on all of the coins and the cash of the European Union, and no one can buy or sell without it. That is the fulfillment of the prophecy in Apocalypse 13.17 about how no one can buy or sell without the mark of the beast. In fact, in the year 2013, the European Union did something which strikingly confirmed this point, a point we originally published in 2010. In 2013, the EU decided to add the image of Europa, the woman riding on the beast, directly to its banknotes. Here are two videos put out by the European Union concerning the addition of the image of Europa to the banknotes. Portraits have long been used in banknotes all over the world. And research has shown that people tend to remember faces. That's why we chose to include a face in the second series of Euro banknotes. The hologram and the watermark include an image of Europa, a figure from Greek mythology. Our continent was named after her. And we found a perfect illustration in the Louvre of how she was depicted over 2000 years ago. Ce vase est un cratère qui servait au mélange, au mélange du vin et de l'eau. Au centre de l'image et au premier plan se trouvent les deux protagonistes. Donc à gauche, cette jeune femme, donc bouclée, parée de bijoux, donc un collier, des bracelets, vêtue d'un vêtement finement plissé. Et devant elle, donc un taureau, d'une blancheur éclatante, nous disent les textes et qui semble s'incliner devant elle dans un geste de révérence. Il s'agit bien donc d'Europe et de Zeus métamorphosé en taureau. Welcome to the Eurocash Academy. My name's Europa and I'm your guide. This module is all about Euro banknotes. They have been circulating for a while now, so to keep them secure, a new series is being introduced. To find out more, watch the video. So, the European Union's banknotes, which already had the mark of the beast slash empire, will now include an image of Europa herself the woman who sits on the beast. That corresponds precisely to what St. John saw, the woman sitting on the beast. This is an obvious indication that, just as we pointed out, the European Union is the beast out of the sea, the beast which St. John saw. This beast has its mark, that is, the map of the empire, and now the woman, Europa, who represents the empire, on its currency. It's also interesting that the image of Europa is called a water mark. Now, the reference to the mark of the beast on the hand or head is clearly a reference to a spiritual mark, 
It echoes statements in Deuteronomy and Exodus, in which marks or signs on the hand and head denote spiritual signs or marks. Read Exodus 13.16 and Deuteronomy 11.18 about the spiritual marks or signs on one's hand and between one's eyes, that is, on the forehead. The mark on the hand and head is not a physical mark. In fact, the description of a spiritual character or emblem on the hand or head corresponds to a sacramental character in Catholic sacramental theology. Catholic theology teaches that souls are marked or signed in baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. By its reference to a spiritual mark associated with the hand or head, the Apocalypse is indicating that this spiritual mark is part of a new false sacramental system imposed by the spiritual authority in Europa, the evil antipopes leading the counter-church in Rome. These evil kings, particularly the antipopes of the Vatican II sect, institute a new sacramental system in Europa which replaces the traditional sacramental system. As the heads of the churchgoers are marked in certain sacraments, such as baptism, the hands of the priests are anointed in ordination rites. The reference to the new mark on the head is thus a general description of how lay people are submitting to the new sacramental system of the beast, and the mark on the hand, evoking images of priestly ordination and the anointing of the hands, concerns a general description of how members of the clergy are submitting to new ordination rites, and thus the sacramental system of the beast. Hence, the beast, Europa, imposes its mark both on its currency and on people's hands and heads. It has a political entity impose the mark on the currency, without which no one can buy or sell, and it has its religious leader, the kings in Rome, the anti-popes of the Vatican II sect, impose the spiritual mark on people's hands and head. It's also interesting that in Mark 12, 14 and following, when Jesus is asked about the mark or image on the coin of Caesar, which was the mark on the coins of the empire, he responds by making a distinction between a physical mark or image on the coins and the currency and the spiritual mark or image on people's souls. I believe that's another indication that the mark of the beast has a twofold aspect or two components. There is the image or mark on the coins and the currency imposed by the secular authority, the modern day Caesar, which represents the secular authority's power. And there is the spiritual image or mark on the souls of men which results from submitting to the new religious system of the empire. It should also be noted that the Apocalypse does not say that those who buy or sell with the mark of the beast go to hell, but rather that those who receive the mark on the hand or head, the spiritual mark, go to hell. See, for example, Apocalypse 14.9, 14.11, 20 verse 4, etc. That also corresponds to Jesus' teaching in Mark 12, in which he says that it's not wrong to use the image of Caesar on the coin as long as you keep the image on your soul for God. The Apocalypse also says that those who worship the image of the beast go to hell. It says that this is the image of one of the kings who is wounded. That worship of the image of the beast, the one who is wounded, which brings damnation, also finds its fulfillment with Europa's spiritual authority, as we will see. Furthermore, the reference to a spiritual mark on the hand and head does not mean that everyone who has ever received an alleged sacrament in the new sacramental system in Europa is forever branded by the mark of the beast. Rather, it is a general description of how people are obstinately submitting to Europa's new and valid spiritual authority, the anti-popes, the evil kings in Rome, and the new church and sacramental system they have imposed. For example, the new form of mass which is Protestantized and invalid. Thus, both the political and religious aspects are involved in Europa's story, the story which St. John tells. It's interesting that Europa was a figure from pre-Christian Greek mythology. That is, she was depicted before the birth of Christ. Europa, therefore, was obviously not Christ's bride before he came. She was a pagan woman who represented the pagan peoples of Europe. But then Christ came and Europa began to convert. And the Roman Empire beast persecuted her. Europa cast off her paganism and became Christ's bride. In time, the church triumphed and overtook the empire. As a result, the Roman Empire dissolved and became a Christian one. Europa, who had been a pagan woman sitting on a pagan beast, was now a Christian territory and a Christian Europe. That's why the beast was, but it's not. In the last days, however, the beast is returning in a new form. Europa is casting off Christ and returning to paganism and anti-Christian ways. And this demonic spiritual transformation of Europa has revealed itself not only in the shocking godlessness of modern-day Europe, and the indescribable evils emanating from post-Vatican II Rome, 
but in an entirely new political union, a new empire, a new beast, that makes no mention of God in its constitution and endorses and imposes many other evils. Apocalypse seventeen twelve to 13 also tells us that the ten horns and the beast receive power as kings one hour with the beast, but that they deliver their power to the beast. That fits precisely with the European Union as well. The ten horns are the European nations, the nations which the Roman Empire also occupied, and each nation receives a kingdom within the EU, but the kingship of each one is nominal and ultimately at the mercy of the beast, the EU, which determines the laws and the policies for each nation or king within the Union, hence they deliver their power to the beast. The new empire, the European Union, openly uses the image of Europa, the pagan woman from Greek mythology who rides on the beast, on its currency and in other ways, to signify its rebellion against Christ, to signify that she is a free woman uninhibited by Christ's laws or truths, when she is actually in bondage and headed for destruction. The European Union's open use of the image of Europa the woman St. John describes is an unwitting confirmation both of its Antichrist return to paganism and its stunning fulfillment of apocalyptic prophecy about the woman on the beast. Now, the religious transformation of Europa was largely the result of the inaction and the action of the seven kings in Rome. The first two kings, Popes Pius XI and XII, were validly elected popes, but they enabled the transformation to begin in Europe because, among other things, they did not promptly consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, as requested by Our Lady of Fatima. Pius XII did consecrate Russia in 1952, which fulfilled Our Lady's prophecy that it would eventually be done, but it was late, just as Our Lord said it would be in 1931, quote, Like the King of France, they will repent and do it, but it will be late, end quote. Pius XII consecrated Russia in 1952, after Russia had already spread its errors, certain nations were annihilated, that is, wiped off the map by the Soviet Union, and it granted only a certain period of peace. This period of peace manifested itself in the dissolution of the Soviet Union on December 8, 1991, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, and the vacating of the Office of President on December 25, 1991, Christmas. That's covered in detail in our article, The Whole Truth About the Consecration and Conversion of Russia. All of the objections and misconceptions people have on this topic are answered as well. It's also not just a coincidence that the famous vision of Tui, in which Our Lady appeared once again to Sister Lucia in 1929 to renew the request for the consecration of Russia, occurred on June 13, 1929. Why did Our Lady come back in the year 1929 to renew the request for the consecration? 12 years after Fatima? Well, 1929, as we've covered, was the year the Lateran Treaty was signed. It was signed on February 11th of that year, and it was ratified by Italy on June 7th, 1929, just a few days before the famous vision at Tui. So Our Lady's appearance at Tui in 1929, during which she said the moment has come for the consecration, was just a few days after the Lateran Treaty was ratified by Italy. She came precisely at that time because the end times kingdom the new kingdom in Rome formed from the Lateran Treaty, which would ultimately result in the total transformation of Europe, the creation of a counter-church, a new godless empire, and the apocalyptic apostasy was beginning to take shape. And the reason the apocalypse is so concerned with what's happening in Rome and with the spiritual leadership there is because the Catholic faith is the only true faith, and throughout history Rome was the spiritual center of the one church Christ founded upon St. Peter. The last five kings, Antipope John XXIII through Antipope Benedict XVI, were heretical impostors, non-Catholic antipopes, and ministers of pure evil. They brought about the full-scale transformation of Europa by teaching and implementing a completely new heretical and apostate false religion, which became the Vatican II counterchurch. This spiritually devastated Europe and the world and reduced the true Catholic Church to a faithful remnant, as our Lord prophesied in Luke 18.8. However, despite the fact that the last five kings were heretical antipopes, all of the seven kings were validly ordained priests. Since all of the kings were valid priests, there remained with all of them a distinction between the priestly leadership in Europa, as evil and heretical as the last five kings were, and the secular leadership in Europa, between priest and layman. There was a line of demarcation between the two main spheres of influence, the religious and the secular. But with the end of the seven kings and the elevation of Bergoglio, a layman, to the place where the priestly authority formally ruled, this represents as part of the very last stage of the great apostasy, 
a core fusion between the secular entity, the beast, and the religious one. The priestly class, leading from Rome, has been completely dissolved by the beast, with a layman now leading in that place. That's why the beast is the eighth king. The beast is also said to be the eighth king because it has ultimate authority over the Vatican city-state, which rests within its borders, and remains at its mercy. The beast, the eighth king, is also said to be of the seven, because it's of the seven mountains, Rome. It's New Rome, or the New Roman Empire. As the ultimate and final punishment for its apostasy and impiety and blasphemy, the Vatican II counterchurch, the impostor religious entity in Rome, has now had its priestly status completely revoked and its office extinguished. It has become one with the secular beast, completely fused therein, for its leader is a layman who is not of the priestly class. Its rejection of Christ and his church has culminated in the complete dissolution of the priestly leadership in the Vatican, which throughout history was the center of the Church of Christ and the papacy which Christ established in St. Peter. Some might also ask, does the woman on the beast, the great harlot, only signify Europa, that is, the European continent and its apostasy from Christ, or does it describe the Vatican II sect, the false ecclesiastical structure, the counter-church falsely posing as the Catholic Church, the false bride of Christ in the last days? The answer is that it describes both. When the Apocalypse speaks specifically of Babylon, as it does in chapters 17 and 18, it is referring to the city of Rome, as proven by 1 Peter 5.13 in which St. Peter, writing from the city of Rome, calls it Babylon. In the last days, this city, Babylon or Rome, where the authority of the true church normally resides, is overtaken by antipopes, and makes all the nations drink of the wine of her fornication or apostasy from Christ. That is to say, all of the nations of the worldwide church are following the spiritual leadership of Rome slash Babylon. That's why Apocalypse 17.1 says that the harlot sits upon many waters, which Apocalypse 17.15 defines as peoples, nations, and tongues. Thus, when the city of Rome slash Babylon falls into apostasy and becomes a whore, after its spiritual leadership is usurped by heretical Vatican II antipopes, Rome slash Babylon leads other nations into the same whoredom. Hence, Babylon describes the city of Rome in particular, and by extension, all in the world who have followed the city of Rome's apostasy and spiritual fornication, the Vatican II counterchurch everywhere it exists. That the great harlot refers to the worldwide Vatican II counterchurch, following the city of Rome's end times apostasy, is clear from many verses. Apocalypse 17.4 says that the woman is clothed in purple and scarlet. Bishops wear purple, cardinals wear scarlet. Apocalypse 17.6 says the woman is drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs. The Vatican II church has mocked the saints and martyrs by its false ecumenism and interreligious apostasy. The woman has a golden cup in her hand, which is an instrument of her impiety. Apocalypse 17.4. This is a reference to the chalices used in Catholic masses, which have been replaced and perverted by the harlot in the Vatican II apostasy. The woman's fornication or apostasy has a particular connection with wine, the wine of her whoredom. Apocalypse 17.1-2, also 14.8 and 18.3. And it was the wine portion of the words of consecration which were changed after Vatican II, rendering the new services invalid and in fact idolatrous. The woman is called a mother in Apocalypse 17.5. The harlot's assumption of that title or position is a mockery of the true church, which is considered the mother of all the faithful. The woman has lost the light of the lamp, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, according to Apocalypse 18.23. These are references to the loss of the sanctuary lamp and the real presence of the Eucharist in Vatican II churches, as well as the loss of Christ's voice or teaching and the teaching of the bride. The Catholic Church, in Vatican II churches. And there's more. The woman on the beast, the great harlot, is the worldwide counter-church following Rome in the last days. See our article on this point. The true church still exists, but it has been reduced to a remnant, just as Jesus prophesied in Luke 18.8. And the fact that all of these prophecies concern the transformation of Rome in the last days actually proves, rather than disproves, the authenticity of the Catholic faith. It shows that the Catholic Church is the Bride of Christ, the only true church, and that the whore is a counterfeit of the true church. The whore of Babylon is not the Catholic Church, as the Protestants wrongly say. It is actually the end times counter-Catholic Church, the Vatican II sect, the false bride, which wraps itself in the colors and externals of the true church, but is a separate and illegitimate entity. All of this also fits precisely with the statement in Apocalypse 17.16, 
that the ten horns and the beast shall hate the harlot and shall make her desolate. Normally one wouldn't expect the horns of the beast to hate the harlot who sits on top of the beast. One would think that the horns of the beast would be united with their beast and the woman on top of it. However, the description we are given once again corresponds to the fact that the European Union is the beast. The ten horns, as we covered, are the European nations or territories that constitute the EU. The European nations, the governments, the media outlets, etc., hate the Vatican II Roman harlot. They love to expose her sex scandals, to mock her failings, and they even attempt to divest her of her property and bankrupt her through lawsuits, etc. The nations, or horns of the beast, thus attempt to make her desolate and naked, exactly as the scripture says. The ten horns hate the Vatican II sect, the harlot, because even though it's an apostate sect and it's not truly Catholic, by the very fact that it claims to be the Catholic Church, it stands as a conviction to their godlessness, their liberalism, and their evil ways. Hence, they desire to destroy and remove and extirpate any vestiges of Catholicism from the earth. And this is God's way of punishing the harlot. The ten horns also make the harlot desolate by their promotion of abortion, homosexuality, gay, quote, marriage, contraception, etc. Europe's promotion of these evils renders the churches allied with the harlot even more liberal, lifeless, and desolate. Now, while the woman on the beast does represent the Vatican II sect centered in Rome, especially in the context where Babylon is mentioned, it also represents Europa, the European peoples who together have cast off Christ and become a pagan harlot once again. The two go together precisely because the center of Europa's spiritual identity, the reason Europa has transformed, is found in Rome. Rome's transformation is Europa's transformation. What occurred in Rome with the Vatican II antipopes and the Vatican II apostasy is not only what caused Europa's spiritual transformation, it is the reason Europa has formed a godless political union. That's why there is a focus on the Seven Kings, for what happened with the Seven Kings was the prime moving factor in Europa's story, as the spiritual takes precedence over the secular. Thus the harlot on the beast is Europe, and it is also the Roman harlot of the Vatican II counterchurch. For Europa's harlotry is found and contained precisely in the harlotry of the Vatican II counterchurch. That's why the great harlot, the woman on the beast, is both Europa considered as one big spiritual whore who has rejected Christ, and it is also the end times counterchurch. But when the apocalypse prophesies the specific and physical destruction of Babylon itself, it is prophesying the physical destruction of the city of Rome, which punishment represents the judgment on Europa and the worldwide structure that has followed Babylon's whoredom. It's also quite interesting to consider the chronological and sequential accuracy with which the Apocalypse has prophesied the major entities that have appeared in history during this period. The Apocalypse tells us that people will see the woman clothed with the sun, Fatima, and then the Great Red Dragon right afterwards. As stated earlier, the Communist Soviet Empire was the Great Red Dragon. The initial formation of the Great Red Dragon was in the year 1917, and it lasted until 1991. The chapter of the Apocalypse which immediately follows the mention of the Great Red Dragon is chapter 13. It begins with St. John's vision of a beast coming up out of the sea, the European Union, which also has seven heads, just as the Great Red Dragon did. The Apocalypse is thus telling us that the Great Red Dragon, which dissolved in 1991, will be morphing into and replaced on the world stage, not simply in Russia, by another empire, by a beast out of the sea, the empire on the Mediterranean. And what do we see in actual history after 1991? In the next two years, in 1992 to 1993, as if the apocalypse is reading like a history book, we see the formation of the European Union, the new empire. And this empire is considered by many observers to be the reincarnation of the former Soviet Union, the new unified monster state. Mr. Farage has the floor. Years ago, uh, Mrs. Thatcher recognized the truth behind the European project. She saw that it was about taking away democracy from nation states and handing that power to largely unaccountable people. And how ironic to see the Russian Prime Minister, Dmitry Medvedev, uh, compare your actions and say, I can only compare it to some of the decisions taken by the Soviet authorities. And then we have a new German proposal that says that actually what we ought to do is confiscate some of the value of people's properties in the southern Mediterranean Eurozone states. Uh, this European Union is the new communism. It is power without limits. The apocalypse also tells us that the seven heads of the beast are attached to both the great red dragon and the beast out of the sea. 
The reason the seven heads, or Roman kings, are attached to both the great red dragon and the beast out of the sea is that the period of the seven kings extends through, or touches, both the reign of the great red dragon and the reign of the beast out of the sea. In fact, it's very interesting to note that while the communist revolution overtook Russia in 1917, providing an initial formation to what would become the Soviet Empire, the USSR, the full union of Soviet republics, is recognized as having occurred in the year 1922. 1922 is the same year that Pius XI, who would eventually become the first of the seven kings, was elected pope. So the very same year that the Great Red Dragon presents itself as the USSR, the man who would eventually become the first of the seven Roman kings is elected pope and becomes prominent on the world stage. And the Apocalypse tells us that the seven Roman kings, or heads, are attached to the Great Red Dragon. Thus, one can see how the appearance and history of these events and individuals matches precisely the sequence we are given in the Apocalypse. The seven kings are also said to be attached to both the Great Red Dragon and the Beast out of the Sea, because the seven kings in Rome, by their inaction and by their action, enabled the Great Red Dragon to rise and the godless European Union to form. And the two kings who reign while the Beast out of the Sea exists, John Paul II and Benedict XVI, were the Antichrist and the False Prophet, respectively, and they fulfill all of the prophecies, basically line by line, concerning the head or king of the beast who is wounded, and the other beast who causes people to worship the image of the king or head who is wounded. Indeed, in Apocalypse chapter 17, when St. John explains the meaning of the seven kings and mentions the arrival of the beast out of the sea when five are fallen, he mentions seven heads or kings, but he only singles out and gives specific information or descriptions for two of those kings, the sixth and the seventh kings. Concerning the sixth king, he says, one is, and concerning the seventh, he says, the other is not yet come. Why does he single out those two kings? He singles out those two kings with descriptions one and the other, because they are the two beasts mentioned in Apocalypse 13, the first and the second beasts. They fulfill all of those prophecies. As the kings of Rome, during the reign of the beast out of the sea, they are the spiritual leaders or kings of the beast out of the sea. And as its spiritual kings or faces during that period, they are themselves the beasts, the two mentioned in Apocalypse 13. The Apocalypse specifically tells us that the king or head of the beast who is wounded is also the beast. As Our Lady of La Salette prophesied on September 19, 1846, quote, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. The church will be in eclipse. End quote. In fact, in Apocalypse 13:13, 13, 13, we read that one of the false signs, which sparks enthusiasm for the beast and facilitates the movement to venerate his image, was fire coming down from heaven upon the earth in the sight of men. Well, that occurred during the reign of Benedict XVI, the second beast. The image of John Paul II, the beast who was wounded was seen coming down from the sky in fire in Poland. Many believed it was a miracle. And there are a number of reasons why John Paul II was uniquely significant, why he was indeed the Antichrist. It wasn't just that John Paul II was an antipope of monumental importance, theologically, historically, and culturally. It wasn't just that he was one of the most well-known, photographed, loved, and traveled people in all of human history. It wasn't just that he led millions who claimed to follow the Catholic Church, the only true church, into a Vatican II counter-church of heresy and apostasy. No, in addition to all of those things, the reason John Paul II was the guy, the Antichrist, was that he taught that he and everyone else is Jesus Christ. That's right. John Paul II claimed to be Christ. He claimed to be God. And he did so while sitting in the temple of God. He claimed to be the incarnate Christ, the risen Christ, the Christ of Matthew 16:16, 16, 16, etc. As we proved in our video, quote, St. John Paul II exposed. John Paul II's demonic teaching on that point corresponded precisely to Scripture's doctrinal definition of Antichrist in 1 John 4, 2-3. John Paul II also taught and exhibited things in the areas of false ecumenism and interreligious apostasy that were not only completely condemned by the Catholic Church, by all true popes, and by sacred scripture, but they were actions and teachings so revolutionary that prior to him they would have been considered unimaginable, coming from an alleged pope. Yet once he did them, once he broke down the barrier and did what had been unthinkable, similar activity became acceptable all over the Vatican II counter-church. 
For example, every time the Vatican II antipopes go into a synagogue to worship with the Jews, it's an evil act which signifies apostasy. But it was the first time this occurred, when John Paul II worshipped in a synagogue in 1986, which was the most historically significant and evil. In the same way, while all of the interreligious prayer meetings held by the antipopes with false religions in Assisi, Italy, were extremely evil, and they all manifested apostasy, it was the first meeting in 1986 which was the most historically significant, simply because it was the most revolutionary. It was the first time in the sight of God in the world that the so-called leader of Christianity held such an abominable event. The import, the significance, and the affront offered to God by the first event could not, in a sense, be duplicated. There were also literally thousands of false signs and wonders, usually associated with modern-day false apparitions, which were instrumental in spreading fervent devotion to John Paul II. These false apparitions and false signs were consistent with the description in 2 Thessalonians 2.9 of the false signs and wonders that accompany the reign of the Antichrist and the acceptance of the great apostasy. To give just one example of a false sign that accompanied the reign of John Paul II, the Antichrist, the false apparitions of Medjugorje began occurring in June of 1981, only weeks after the assassination attempt against John Paul II. The two events were clearly related. The shooting of John Paul II was an event that plays an important role in Apocalypse 13. It was the wounding of the head of the beast, who is himself also the beast. On May 13, 1981, John Paul II was shot multiple times by Ali Aja, a professional assassin. John Paul II suffered multiple gunshot wounds at close range, yet he survived. The assassin Aja later expressed amazement that he did not kill John Paul II, and when the two met, Aja asked John Paul II how it was possible that he survived the shooting. It was a deadly wounding from which John Paul II recovered, and people were astonished by him, because, among other things, it occurred on the anniversary of Fatima, May 13. On the heels of the assassination attempt against John Paul II, false apparitions such as Medjugorje were intended to promote the lie that John Paul II was the one whom evil forces were trying to eliminate, that he was holy, special, and to be followed. That is exactly what the devil wanted people to believe, so that multitudes would accept John Paul II's new false religion and the counter-church which he led. False signs and wonders accompanied the false messages about John Paul II. In addition to all of his other mind-boggling heresies, blasphemies, and apostasy, John Paul II was the man who buried the message of Fatima, and defrauded the entire world of the true third secret of Fatima, as covered in our video, The Third Secret of Fatima. Even though he was the one who hid the true third secret, and foisted a false one upon the world, he, the Antichrist, wound up getting himself accepted as the hero of Fatima. John Paul II also taught universal salvation, denied that heaven, hell, and purgatory are places, agreed with the Lutherans on justification, praised the social justice and planning, in other words, abortions, of communist China, partook in the ceremonies of demonic religions, and much more. And then came Benedict XVI, Joseph Ratzinger, the man who exercised all the power on behalf of, or in the sight of, John Paul II, when he was head of the CDF under John Paul II. Exactly as it says in Apocalypse 13.12, it says that the second beast exercised power in the sight of, or on behalf of, the first beast, whose wound was healed, and that this second beast, who exercised all the power in the sight of the first beast, causes people to worship the image of the first beast, whose wound was healed. Apocalypse 13.11 also says that this second beast comes out of the earth. Benedict XVI's name, Ratzinger or Rat, signifies beast out of the earth in almost all major languages. For in the book of Genesis, the Bible itself defines that beasts of the earth are the land creatures, and there is no better description of a land creature, a beast of the earth, who comes out of the earth, than a rat. And the names of biblical figures frequently signify their role or character. The beast out of the earth is the one who causes people to worship the image of the first beast, whose wound was healed. Benedict XVI's name in Greek, Benedictos, also equals exactly 666, just as it says in Apocalypse 13 concerning the number of the name of the beast. By, quote, beatifying John Paul II, declaring him blessed, and fast-tracking his, quote, canonization process, Benedict XVI officially approved the worship slash veneration of John Paul II's image. Benedict XVI was the one who convinced the world to make an image of the beast, 
who was wounded and yet lived. And what's so fascinating is that the word in Greek in Apocalypse 13, 12, which is sometimes translated worship or adore, as in the second beast causes people to worship or adore the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed, that word in Greek is proskuneho. That word is the very same word used by the Catholic Church at the Second Council of Nicaea to describe the veneration of the blessed and the saints. Proskuneho can mean adoration in the sense of latria, but it can also mean simply veneration in the sense of the honor given to the blessed and the saints. Indeed, in its dogmatic teaching, the Church uses proskuneho to describe the veneration of the blessed and the saints. In addition, the Greek word for the image of the beast being venerated is akon. It's the word from which we get icon or image. When we are given the word for the veneration of the blessed and the saints, as well as a description of image slash icon veneration, there is an obvious reference to the church's traditional veneration of the blessed and the saints being perverted in a demonic way by giving this veneration to a devilish figure a man who claimed to be Jesus Christ, was wounded, was a king of Rome, was the false hero of Fatima, an emperor figure, etc. Benedict XVI's quote, beatification of John Paul II, and the 2014 quote, canonization, which Benedict XVI fast-tracked and made possible, clearly fulfilled what is written here. This is very interesting. It says that the second beast gives life to the image of the beast, the word for life here in Greek is pneuma, which means breath or animation or spirit. Now, St. John obviously lived before the invention of television or video technology. He had no idea what video footage and television images were. Therefore, if he had a vision of John Paul II, the beast who was wounded, having his image slash icon venerated by the second beast during a ceremony which also featured video footage or televised images of John Paul II, moving and speaking, how would St. John describe it? He would describe it as the image or icon of John Paul II appearing to be alive, as being animated, as having life. He would describe video footage as an image with life, an image that even speaks. And in fact, the very next words of Apocalypse 13.15 say, quote, and that the image of the beast should speak, end quote. St. John's description of an image having life and even speaking fits precisely with a vision of video footage, for St. John would hear sounds coming from the television screen and the animated image. And guess what? At the, quote, beatification ceremony of John Paul II, ABC News reported that not only were posters honoring John Paul II's life put up all over Rome, but large television screens showing images of John Paul II were erected along the Roman street that leads to St. Peter's Basilica. The BBC also reported that there was a giant video screen at the, quote, beatification. Quote, St. Peter's Square was transformed for the occasion with a giant video screen showing John Paul II's life story and a massive photograph hung from the white colonnades, end quote. John Paul II was also, quote, beatified on May 1st, the Feast of the Beast for Satanists. Furthermore, during the canonization of John Paul II, his image was projected around the world in an unprecedented 3D ceremony. John Paul II's image was thus presented to the world as if it were alive. Hence, the statement in Apocalypse 13.15 that the second beast gave life to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast should even speak, fits precisely with the beatification and canonization of John Paul II, which featured video images of John Paul II's icon speaking, moving, having life. That was the fulfillment of Apocalypse 13.15. After it says that the second beast gives life to the image of the beast and that the image of the beast should speak, Apocalypse 13.15 goes on to say, quote, And he should cause that whosoever will not worship the image of the beast should be slain. End quote. The word here in Greek, which is usually translated slain or killed, is from the Greek word apokteno. That word can mean physically kill, but it doesn't always mean physically kill. In fact, to give just one example, in Romans 7.11, St. Paul uses the same Greek word to describe spiritual death or the loss of spiritual life. Benedict XVI, the second beast, indeed fulfilled that part of the verse by imposing the worship of the beast under the pain of the loss of spiritual life. Benedict XVI beatified John Paul II, making his feast day October 22nd. 
He also set the canonization process in motion by fast-tracking it. In Catholic teaching, a canonization formally requires people to consider the canonized person a saint under pain of mortal sin and the loss of spiritual life. And for a full discussion of the various ways that the, quote, canonization of John Paul II indeed implicated the followers of the Vatican II sect in idolatry and the worship of false gods, directly fulfilling prophecy about the beast and its imposition of idolatry, see our crucial video, The Beast That Was and Is Not Has Returned. Therefore, through the canonization of John Paul II, the entire world following the Vatican II sect and the antipopes was required under pain of mortal sin to venerate John Paul II as a saint. Benedict XVI, the second beast, was the one who began the process for and made possible the universal imposition of the veneration of John Paul II in fulfillment of Apocalypse 13.15. Moreover, Benedict XVI's imposition of the acceptance of John Paul II, under pain of separation from full communion and therefore the loss of spiritual life, was made clear in the negotiations with the Society of St. Pius X. Benedict XVI's negotiations with the Society of St. Pius X were representative of what he was telling all independent, quote, traditionalists. When Benedict XVI made it clear to the SSPX and everyone else that they cannot be considered in, quote, full communion, unless they accept Vatican II, the, quote, magisterium of John Paul II, etc. He was saying that unless you accept Vatican II and John Paul II, you are slain, that is, outside of full communion with the Church. Benedict XVI, the second beast, was the one who told the world to make an image of the first beast, who was wounded and yet lived. It's also interesting that the second beast is typically identified as the false prophet, while the first beast, who is wounded, and whose image is honored, is identified as the Antichrist. John Paul II, with his Antichrist teaching about man, fits precisely with the title of Antichrist, and Benedict XVI, the second beast, who causes people to worship John Paul II, fits precisely with the title of False Prophet. For while Benedict XVI was a monumental heretic, as are material documents, he amazingly retained a reputation as a conservative. He also seduced members of the counterchurch, by giving more access to the Latin Mass. This move deceived multitudes. It duped many into believing that there was still hope in the counter-church, and it persuaded people that Benedict XVI was not evil, but good, and that he would perhaps reverse the entire course of the Vatican to apostasy, when in fact nothing could be further from the truth. Benedict XVI was a manifestly heretical antipope, a true theological revolutionary, who expanded the Vatican to apostasy, organized the worship of the beast, and fractured independent so-called traditionalists by making overtures to them on the one hand, pretending to be concerned about tradition, while simultaneously refusing to admit them into his, quote, full communion, without a complete recognition of the evil doctrines of the counter-church. And the reason that what we've covered here, concerning John Paul II as the first beast, and Benedict XVI as the second beast who causes people to honor his image, fits so precisely with the text of Apocalypse 13, and no other attempted explanation would even come close to matching the accuracy with which this corresponds to the text, is because this is the fulfillment. In Apocalypse 17.6, when St. John explains his vision of the Whore of Babylon, the woman who sits upon the city of seven mountains, clothed in purple and scarlet, he says this, quote, When I saw her, I wondered with great wonder. The word he uses in Greek to express how he wondered is from the verb thaumadzo, meaning I wonder or marvel. In Apocalypse chapter 13, when St. John describes the beast out of the sea and the Antichrist, that is, the head or king of the beast who is wounded and then has his image venerated, he uses the same verb. Apocalypse 13.3, quote, One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth wondered as they followed the beast, End quote. Is there a reason that St. John uses the same verb to describe how he wondered at the whore of Babylon, and how the people wondered at the Antichrist, the head or king of the beast who was wounded, and then has his image venerated? Yes, he uses the same verb to describe the wonder at both, because the beast and the whore of Babylon are part of one and the same entity. To wonder at one is to wonder at the other. 
In fact, immediately after St. John wondered at the whore of Babylon with great wonder, in the very next verse we read this, quote, But the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her, end quote. Notice, when the angel explains the mystery of the whore, he's also explaining the mystery of the beast. One and the same explanation covers the woman and the beast with seven heads, because the beast carries her. She sits on top of it. The woman and the beast are part of the same mystery because they are part of the same entity. As we explained in our video, Is the World About to End?, and as will be further demonstrated in this video. What this means is that if you've identified the whore of Babylon, then you've identified the beast out of the sea with seven heads and the Antichrist, the head of the beast who is wounded. You cannot say that the deception of the whore of Babylon exists in one century, period, or area, but that the deception of the Antichrist and the beast out of the sea comes along in a different century, period, or area. No, if one is there, then the other must be present, because the whore sits on top of the beast. Likewise, you cannot say that the whore of Babylon is a religious deception which arises in Rome, without also saying that the deception of the Antichrist and the beast out of the sea is intimately connected to what's occurring in Rome and with the whore of Babylon. If you've identified the deception of one, then you've identified the deception of the other, both in time period and location, because the whore of Babylon sits on top of the beast out of the sea. So, what is the whore of Babylon? It is not the Catholic Church, as the Protestants wrongly say. As the points we just covered show, anyone who thinks that the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon must say that the deception of the Antichrist has been present for all of Catholic history, because the explanation of the whore is the explanation of the beast, and the whore sits on top of the beast. But that is, of course, false. The whore of Babylon is not the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is the one true church founded by Jesus Christ. The whore of Babylon is, rather, the end times counterfeit Catholic Church as our video Is the World About to End demonstrates in detail. The Whore of Babylon is the false bride, the counter-church which arises in the last days when the city of seven hills, the city of Rome, not the Catholic Church itself, is overtaken by anti-popes and falls into apostasy from the true Catholic faith. As Our Lady of La Salette prophesied on September 19, 1846, quote, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist, the Church will be in eclipse, end quote. The whore is thus clothed in the colors of the bride, but she is not the bride. The whore of Babylon is the Vatican II sect that's currently occupying Rome and leading people into apostasy from the Catholic faith. The whore's apostasy and spiritual fornication, which has led almost the entire world astray, has indeed reduced the true Catholic Church to a faithful remnant in the final days, just as Jesus prophesied about the end times in Luke 18.8. Now, the whore of Babylon, the counter-church in Rome, sits on top of the beast out of the sea because the beast out of the sea is a new version of the pagan Roman Empire. This new version of the pagan Roman Empire is manifested politically in the European Union, and it is manifested spiritually or religiously in the Vatican II sect. And Rome's apostasy from the Catholic faith, enabled and led by the kings of the Vatican city-state in Rome, was the primary factor in how this new version of the pagan Roman Empire was able to form in Europe. Rome is therefore the spiritual capital of the beast out of the sea. What happened in Rome is why the beast out of the sea was able to form. That's why the whore sits on top of the beast. And that's why the explanation of the whore is part of the explanation of the beast. The fact that St. John's prophecy concerns the formation of a new version of the pagan Roman Empire in the final days, as a consequence of Europe's apostasy from Christ, is precisely why St. John's description of the woman on the beast fits exactly with the image of the woman Europa in Greek mythology. St. John's prophecy is about Europa or Europe in the final days in its political and religious dimensions. The fact that the end times beast out of the sea, described in chapters 13 and 17 of the Apocalypse, is a new version of the pagan Roman Empire, is precisely why Apocalypse 17.8 says that the beast out of the sea is a beast that was and is not. In scripture, beasts out of the sea are empires that arise on the Mediterranean Sea. We learn that from the prophecies of Daniel. The pagan Roman Empire was the beast on the sea in St. John's day. It is the beast that was. It persecuted the faithful. It caused many to deny the faith, embrace idolatry, and worship false gods. However, the pagan Roman Empire beast was replaced by Christian Europe, 
Hence, the beast that was ceased to be. That means that prior to the rise of the end times beast out of the sea, the pagan Roman Empire, the beast that was, is not, because Christian Europe had replaced it. In the final days, however, Christian Europe will apostatize from Christ and return to paganism as a consequence of following the apostasy and whoredom of the city of Rome. This will result in the rise of a new pagan empire in Europe on the Mediterranean Sea. The beast that was and is not shall return. That's what St. John's prophecy in chapters 13 and 17 of the Apocalypse is about, and it has been fulfilled before our very eyes, as we will see. This video will not cover the many different ways in which Europa, both politically and religiously, fulfills the various prophecies about the beast out of the sea and the whore of Babylon sitting on top of it. See the video, Is the World About to End?, for all of that information. Rather, this video will focus on perhaps the single most important way in which Europa represents the new version of the pagan Roman Empire and indeed fulfills the prophecies in the Apocalypse about the beast. We will focus on the beast's imposition of idolatry and the worship of false gods. As we cover these facts, keep in mind that from the standpoint of the faith, the most important feature of the pagan Roman Empire, the beast that was, was its imposition of a ceremony or ceremonies, through which Catholics, often under pain of penalties, were required to worship false gods and deny the first commandment. Of course, some rejected the empire's requirement, as they should have. They maintained the true faith of Christ, despite the consequences. However, multitudes did give in and accept Rome's idolatry and worship of false gods. In the process, they denied the first commandment and apostatized from the faith of Christ. And keep in mind that the empire's imposition of idolatry was often intertwined with the requirement to honor the Roman king and his image. That was a key feature of the beast that was. And even though Roman emperors were technically speaking emperors rather than kings, they were in reality kings. See, for example, John 19.15, where Tiberius Caesar, the Roman emperor at the time, is referred to as a king. There we read that people who called for Christ's crucifixion stated, quote, We have no king but Caesar, end quote. Thus, the honor given to the Roman emperor and his image was honor given to a Roman king. And the pagan Roman empire often connected its imposition of idolatry and the worship of false gods with the requirement to honor the Roman king and his image. As we will see, in the new version of the pagan Roman empire, modern-day Europa, the exact same thing has occurred. The beast that was and is not has returned. In Matthew chapter 23, we read that Jesus said the following, quote, Woe to you blind guides, who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, If anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You serpents, you brood of vipers! How will you escape the sentence of hell? As I will show in this video, the principle explained in this passage provides the key to understanding the full meaning of John Paul II's quote canonization and how it fits in to the prophecies in the Apocalypse concerning the beast. First, John Paul II's quote canonization was not a valid act of the papacy because Francis, the man who canonized him, is not a true pope. According to Catholic teaching, Francis is, like the other post-Vatican II claimants to the papacy, a completely heretical non-Catholic anti-pope. Since he's a heretic and therefore outside the Catholic Church, he's ineligible for the papal office. We have proven that without any doubt in our materials. Therefore, in the eyes of true Catholics who accept the papacy and all of Catholic teaching, the canonization of John Paul II has no validity. See our website and material for all the information on that issue. However, for the hundreds of millions of people in the world who claim to be Catholic, follow the Vatican II sect, and wrongly consider Francis to be the Pope, the canonization of John Paul II is not only of the utmost significance, it is spiritually fatal and apocalyptic. Here's why. It's a fact that for decades, John Paul II promoted false ecumenism and religious indifferentism. False ecumenism and religious indifferentism are condemned by the teaching of sacred scripture and the Catholic Church, 
See, for example, Pope Pius XI's 1928 encyclical Mortalium Animos. Not only did John Paul II fully endorse and promote false ecumenism and religious indifferentism, he actually facilitated and organized the worship of idols and false gods. John Paul II facilitated and organized the worship of idols and false gods by holding prayer events to which he invited the practitioners of various non-Christian and pagan religions. Scripture teaches that the gods of non-Christian and pagan religions are not God, but devils. See Psalm 95.5, 5, 1 Chronicles 16.26, and 1 Corinthians 10.20. Yet John Paul II invited and encouraged the followers of those religions to come to Assisi and conduct their worship of false gods. He even gave them a place to do so. He actually turned former Catholic churches into rooms or temples dedicated to the worship of false gods. The most notorious examples of his facilitation of idolatry were the Assisi World Days of Prayer for Peace. The first Assisi event occurred in 1986, the second one in 2002. But John Paul II actually endorsed and sponsored many similar events. He sponsored similar events in Kyoto 1987, Rome 1988, and Warsaw 1989, to name just a few. For decades, both in word and in deed, John Paul II encouraged the followers of non-Christian and pagan religions to continue in false religions, false worship, and idolatry. In fact, John Paul II officially taught, including in encyclicals, that the worship of other gods, which occurs in non-Christian religions, is good and is the result of divine inspiration and power. Logically, that means that the one who holds divine power in the universe desires people to worship other gods, and therefore that the other gods are true. Indeed, when John Paul II called the Assisi events, he wasn't organizing a food drive at which some idolaters might be present. He wasn't calling for a strategy session for world peace at which some idolaters might show up. No, he called a day of prayer and worship to bring about peace. Efficacious prayer and worship to divine power was the essence and purpose of the event. Consider that deeply. And for prayer and worship that would be heard, that would be efficacious, he called for prayer to other gods, along with the Catholic God. That is a profession of faith that prayer to other gods is efficacious, and consequently that those gods are true gods. Professions of faith can be made in deed as well as in word. So, in addition to inviting heretics of various stripes to the first Assisi event, John Paul II invited Jews and Muslims who reject the Holy Trinity and the divinity of Christ. He also brought Buddhists, Hindus, Zoroastrians, African animists who worship the Great Thumb, among other things, Shinto priests from Japan who worship various false gods, Jains, American Indian pagans, and followers of the Baha'i religion. The followers of the Baha'i religion believe that Krishna, Buddha, and others were messengers of the Divine One, along with Jesus. At the first Assisi event, a statue of Buddha was notoriously placed on the altar at the Church of St. Francis. At the second Assisi meeting in 2002, John Paul II had it arranged in advance that each religion was given a separate room in which to worship its, quote, God or gods. All the crucifixes were removed, and those which could not be removed were covered. The Muslims required a room facing toward Mecca, and John Paul II provided them with one. The Zoroastrians needed a room with a window so that the smoke from the wood chips that they burned to their god could exit through it, and it was given to them. The Jews wanted a room that had never before been blessed. In other words, a room that had never been blessed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and John Paul II provided them with one. The, quote, traditional African religions, including animists and voodooists, received a room for their worship, which includes the honoring of snakes and spirits of various kinds. So, it's absolutely true to say, and no honest person can dispute it, that John Paul II became the builder of little temples to false gods. That's a fact. He built temples for the various gods who were worshipped by the various religions at Assisi. He provided them with a place to worship those gods, and he brought the worship of those gods in front of the entire world. Moreover, at Assisi too, John Paul II arranged it so that the representative of each false religion came to the pulpit to give a sermon on world peace and on his or her religion. In the presence of John Paul II, a voodoo high priest came to the pulpit and promoted the voodoo religion. The Hindu representative stated that everyone is God. The representatives of other false religions likewise gave their talks. And what John Paul II organized for Assisi 1 and 2 was replicated by Benedict XVI at Assisi 3. Therefore, it's absolutely true to say that in addition to being the builder of temples to false gods, John Paul II was a missionary for those gods. He was a missionary for those gods 
because he provided a worldwide platform on which the followers and worshippers of those gods could bring the message of the gods and the worship of the gods to the world with a prominence and with a recognition that they never otherwise would have had. Now, to understand what this really means, theologically and apocalyptically, in light of John Paul II's, quote, canonization, in light of the fact that he is now formally considered a saint by hundreds of millions who claim to be Catholic, suppose for a moment that there's a pagan religion which worships a false god, and suppose that within that pagan religion there is a well-known, quote, saint. This particular, quote, saint or hero is honored by the followers of that pagan religion for the reason that he is known for building a temple to the, quote, god. This saint is the famous temple builder. Since he built the temple in which the god is worshipped, honored, and served, he is special to the followers of that religion. He is considered holy. He became a saint because he provided a home for their god. He built the place where their god is worshipped and served. But if he is considered a saint in that religion, merely because he built the temple to the god, then what does that of necessity say about the god for whom the temple is built? It necessarily means that just as the saint who built the temple is holy and sanctified, the god for whom the temple is built is also holy, and even more holy. One flows from the other, directly, logically, inescapably, as Jesus taught. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it, and whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! If the one who built the temple is a saint, that's only because the temple he built is holy. That makes perfect sense. And if the temple is holy, that's only because the one for whom the temple is built is even more holy. Thus, if the builder of the temple is a saint, that's only because the God worshipped in the temple is a true God with the power to sanctify or make saints of those who serve and worship him. Do you see what this means? It means, necessarily, that everyone in the world who accepts John Paul II as a saint and knows anything about his life, worships false gods. There is no way around it. They consider false gods to be holy and true, possessing the power to sanctify or make saints of those who serve them. They also consider pagan temples where false gods are worshipped to be holy. There is no escape from that conclusion. It flows directly from one, the recognition of John Paul II as Sanctus, and two, the indisputable fact that he built temples for the worship of false gods, and that he served false gods. Some might respond by arguing, but I disagree with John Paul II's activity at Assisi and with other religions. I denounce it. I only accept him as a saint for the other things that he did. I don't believe that he was sanctified or made holy when he served other gods, or when he built their temples, or when he brought their worship before the world, or when he called for them to be worshipped at Assisi, or when he taught that their religions are the products of divine work. I believe, rather, that he was sanctified when he worshipped the true God in the Catholic Church. That response fails, however. The person who makes such an argument is still implicated in idolatry and has denied the first commandment. For in that case, the person is stating that true and sanctifying worship of the one true God, the kind of worship needed to become a saint, does not necessarily exclude serving other gods or building their temples. But the very first commandment of the one true God is, you shall not have strange gods before me, you shall not serve other gods, and you shall not worship other gods. For I am a jealous God. Exodus chapters 20 and 34. The very first commandment of the one true God tells us that sanctifying worship of him, the kind of worship needed to become a saint, necessarily excludes as its first and primary condition, serving other gods, building their temples, etc. Therefore, someone who professes that John Paul II is a saint, professes belief in a, quote, God, who does not exclude serving other gods as a requirement for sanctification. And that's not the true God. The person's position is therefore idolatrous. The person professes belief in a false god because the one true God has identified himself as the one who, first and foremost, excludes serving other gods as his condition for sanctification. Hence, to formally acknowledge John Paul II as a saint, or to call him a saint, as the entire world following the Vatican II sect now does, 
is to profess that false gods have the power to sanctify those who serve them, or that the true, quote, God does not exclude serving other gods. There's no way around it, and such a position is idolatrous. That's why the honor given to John Paul II's image is prophesied in Apocalypse chapter 13. The veneration of the image of the Roman king or head of the beast who is wounded, recovers, and deceives the world, as our video Is the World About to End covers in detail. The veneration of his image figures prominently into the prophecy about the beast and the Antichrist, precisely because the honoring of his image is the instrument and the means through which the entire world, following the Vatican II sect, has been directly implicated in idolatry and the worship of a false god or gods. Never before in history have so many professing Catholics been so quickly and automatically implicated in idolatry and a rejection of the First Commandment. The ramifications of this are mind-boggling. It's why for years we've emphasized that people must not accept the Vatican II antipopes as true popes, and why we've proven that they are not true popes for X, Y, and Z reasons. In fact, in many ways, our work demonstrating that the post-Vatican II claimants to the papacy are not valid popes, a fact that should be quite obvious in light of anti-Pope Francis's activity, pointed to the period we are in right now. For those who still wrongly consider the Vatican II sect to be the Catholic Church and its leaders to be true popes, are in a spiritually fatal position. They are required to venerate John Paul II as a saint, and that is to deny the first commandment and worship a false god. Indeed, it is precisely through the honor given to John Paul II and his image that the devil has been able to get many so-called conservatives who never otherwise would have participated in something like a Sisi or kissing the Koran to accept idolatry anyway. By venerating John Paul II as a saint, which is now required under pain of mortal sin for followers of the Vatican II sect, those, quote, conservatives are implicated in a CC in kissing the Koran, etc., whether they like it or not. With this in mind, we should be able to see quite clearly how the beast that was and is not has returned in its most essential feature and characteristic, that is, the imposition of idolatry and the worship of false gods, and how this has been accomplished through the veneration of the image of the Roman king. And John Paul II, in addition to being an anti-pope, was an actual Roman king or monarch. He was one of the seven kings of the Vatican city-state, a new monarchy that came into existence in Rome in 1929 with the Lateran Treaty, as our videos Is the World About to End and Francis and the Seven Kings of the Apocalypse explain. So, just as the pagan Roman Empire beast implicated multitudes of Christians in idolatry and the worship of false gods, through the honor given to the Roman king and the associated ceremony. The end times beast out of the sea does exactly the same thing. However, the modern version of the beast manages to implicate people all over the world in idolatry and a rejection of the first commandment in a more diabolically efficient way. That is, through the formal veneration of John Paul II, a man who notoriously served false gods. To better understand the horrifying consequences of this situation, consider the following example. Suppose that a young professing Catholic around the age of 14 or 15 is told that John Paul II is a saint. The young man honors John Paul II's feast day. A short time later, he looks up John Paul II and he learns that John Paul II invited the worshippers of other gods to Assisi so that they could worship those gods alongside the Catholic God. If he still accepts John Paul II as a saint at that point, even if he doesn't know anything else about the arguments for why John Paul II was a heretic, why the Vatican II sect is not the Catholic Church, how there have been anti-popes in history, how this situation was prophesied, etc., the young man is nevertheless implicated in idolatry. He has denied the first commandment by accepting that one can become holy by serving other gods and building their temples, or that one can be sanctified by, quote, God, despite serving other gods, which means that the God he now believes in is not the one true God. And it doesn't even matter if the young man or anyone else who calls John Paul II a saint never goes to a temple of the false gods, and never professes outward belief in those gods. It doesn't make any difference. By simply accepting John Paul II as a saint, the person has denied the first commandment by holding that a person who serves other gods can be sanctified. That's why the honor given to John Paul II's image is foretold in the Apocalypse. It represents the universal imposition of the evils and the idolatry of the Vatican II sect, the Great Harlot, upon its followers including upon so-called conservatives who otherwise never would have accepted them or blessed them. 
and it's important to note that if the aforementioned young man had heard that some random so-called Catholic, for whom he had no special respect, organized the followers of other gods to worship those gods, and brought the worship of those gods to the world, in that case the young man might be inclined to question that person's activity or reject him outright as wicked and a false believer. Of course he should do so. However, the fact that serving other gods is now presented to the young man as the activity conducted by John Paul II, a man his, quote, church tells him was holy and is a saint, serves as a powerful enticement to accept John Paul II as holy anyway, and thereby accept that one who serves other gods can be sanctified. That's why this is so devastating and significant. It means that all those, including many, quote, traditionalists, who may have even criticized the Assisi events and John Paul II's religious indifferentism, yet accept him as a saint, or even just call him a saint, because they accept anti-Pope Francis, are idolaters. They have denied the first commandment. They profess belief in a God who sanctifies those who serve other gods. That's not the true God. These points demonstrate that all those who have obstinately defended the Vatican II anti-popes in the face of the facts are deceivers. Their obstinate adherence to a false position has kept them and others on a direct path to idolatry, and they have now arrived at the destination point. They have served the interests of the devil. They have worked as ministers of Satan and defenders of the Antichrist. These facts show why it's essential to adhere to the true position and widely disseminate the information proving that the Vatican II sect is not the Catholic Church. There are also a few who cling desperately to the counter-church, but they know they cannot accept the wicked John Paul II as a saint because of what he did in his life. So, they have contrived ways to reject the canonization, yet still claim to accept Francis as the Pope. But they are only fooling themselves. Anti-Pope Francis proclaimed the canonization of John Paul II with the fullness of his, quote, authority. The essential formula he used was as solemn as any canonization in history. If Francis holds the papal office, which he definitely doesn't, the canonization of John Paul II would be as authoritative as any in church history. The process he used and the examination he conducted prior to the solemn declaration are irrelevant. God protects the acts of true popes in such matters, regardless of the study the pope engages in or the process he utilizes, as those who actually believe in papal infallibility know. Therefore, those who say that Francis is the pope, an absurd position on its face, but reject his canonization of John Paul II, have simply fallen into a schismatic position and denied papal infallibility. They have departed from Catholic teaching and embraced something akin to, quote, old Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy, in a futile attempt to salvage the great harlot and the non-papacy of Francis. In the process, they call into question every canonization in church history. Rather than simply accept and defend the truth that the Vatican II claimants to the papacy are anti-popes, they choose to commit mortal sin and deny the protections Jesus Christ gave to his church and the papal office. The only way to reject the canonization of John Paul II, as people must to be saved, is to correctly acknowledge that Francis is not the pope, but a heretical non-Catholic anti-pope, and that the Vatican II sect is not the Catholic Church. There are others who, in similar desperation, argue that the canonization of John Paul II only means that he repented, or could have repented, of his horrible and wicked activity and then gone to heaven. That claim is also completely false for two reasons. First, since John Paul II consistently promoted false ecumenism, religious indifferentism, and served false gods by his words and deeds in the external forum, according to Catholic teaching, a repudiation of his wicked beliefs and activity would have to be manifested in the external forum for anyone to conclude that he converted from serving false gods. But of course, no such conversion or repudiation of his entire career was ever made in the external forum. In fact, to the contrary, in John Paul II's very last document, his last will and testament, he acknowledges the rabbi of Rome and the representatives of non-Christian religions whose false gods he served. And of course, he does not repudiate his apostasy or call the unbelievers to convert to the true God and the Catholic faith. It is therefore forbidden, according to Catholic principles, for anyone to conclude that John Paul II converted from the religious indifferentism, service of false gods, etc., that he displayed for decades. Catholic principles forbid anyone to conclude that he is anywhere but in hell. Second, the aforementioned argument is demolished by the fact that a canonization of a saint does not merely mean that the person is in heaven. It also means that during that person's life as a Catholic, he or she manifested heroic virtue and lived a model Catholic life, even if the conversion to the true faith, manifested clearly in the external forum, occurred shortly before a person's martyrdom or death. 
As Pope Pius XI taught in his December 31st, 1929 encyclical, quote, the saints have ever been, are, and ever will be the greatest benefactors of society and perfect models for every class and profession, end quote. It is therefore impossible to divorce the canonization of John Paul II from what he did and taught as anti-pope. Indeed, the Vatican II sect canonized him precisely for his career as anti-pope, one that was characterized by wickedness, false ecumenism, religious indifferentism, and the service of false gods. Hence, those who accept John Paul II as a saint reject the first commandment and are implicated in idolatry. People also need to understand that the significance of John Paul II and why he was the Antichrist, is not found in the fact that people think about him much or even almost at all. That actually doesn't make any difference. His significance, rather, is that as a result of what he did in his life, to simply accept him as a saint one time is to reject the first commandment and be implicated in idolatry. That's why the Apocalypse says that all those who honor the image of the beast, the one who is wounded and recovers, and die unconverted, will be tortured day and night, forever and ever. They will never have any rest, the Apocalypse says. And it makes sense, for they will have professed belief in a God who sanctifies those who serve false gods, and that's not the true God. Moreover, as proven in our video, quote, St. John Paul II exposed, John Paul II also claimed to be God. And that corresponds to the prophecies about the beast as well. For in the beast that was the pagan Roman Empire, the Roman king claimed to be Dominus et Deus, Lord and God. John Paul II did the same. That's a fact. But the truth covered on that issue is frankly over the heads of most people. No matter how clearly and thoroughly it has been proven that John Paul II actually preached that the Son of God became every man in the Incarnation, and that he is therefore Jesus Christ the Son of God, most people simply lack the grace and the honesty to recognize what John Paul II taught in that regard. Even though few recognize the truth that John Paul II actually taught that he is Jesus Christ throughout his entire anti-papacy, it makes perfect sense that the one who does fulfill the prophecies about the Antichrist and implicates so many in idolatry also claimed to be God himself. It's also remarkable that through the veneration of his image and the quote canonization, John Paul II is doing as much or even more damage to souls now as he did during his life. The fact that John Paul II was the Antichrist also fits precisely with the prophecies concerning the seven Roman kings, one of whom is wounded seemingly unto death but recovers, and the beast out of the sea, that is, the European Union, arising during the reign of the sixth king when five are fallen. That's covered in detail in our video, Is the World About to End?, and the video, Francis and the Seven Kings of the Apocalypse. With these facts in mind, we should be able to see clearly why the explanation of the Whore of Babylon in Apocalypse 17 is also an explanation of the beast, and why the wonder expressed at the Whore is also the wonder expressed at the beast. It's because the Antichrist himself, the Roman king of the beast who is wounded, and then has his image venerated, is one of the antipopes of the Whore of Babylon. And just as the worship of false gods in the pagan Roman Empire beast was intertwined with a requirement to honor the Roman king. In the new version of the beast, there is likewise a ceremony involving the veneration of the image of the Roman king, which is connected with, and indeed the instrument of, a widespread imposition of idolatry. Moreover, the apostasy of the Whore of Babylon is the reason why the godless European Union, the political dimension of the beast out of the sea, was able to form. Hence, the Whore sits on top of the beast. Her demonic spiritual leadership and whoredom is the reason a new pagan empire formed in Europe, replacing Christian Europe. Thus, when we look at the actual fulfillment of the prophecy about the beast that was and is not, and the Roman whore who sits on top of it, we can see quite clearly why the angel's explanation of the one was an explanation of the other, and why the wonder expressed at the one was the wonder expressed at the other. And the parallels between the beast that was, the pagan Roman Empire, and the new version, modern-day Europe, become even more interesting. In the beast that was, the pagan Roman Empire, they didn't just impose the worship of false gods and the image of the Roman king. They also required people to honor numerous deceased pagan Roman kings. And in modern-day Europe, the beast out of the sea, the exact same thing is happening. The Whore of Babylon has moved to officially venerate the images of various anti-popes of the Vatican II sect. The men who, like John Paul II, also embraced paganism, endorsed evils of various kinds, 
and served false gods. These were the Roman kings of the Vatican city-state most responsible for the formation of the Vatican II sect, the transformation of Europe, and Europe's return to paganism. That's why anti-Pope John XXIII, the wicked heretic and Freemason who called the Second Vatican Council, was also, quote, canonized, and the veneration of his image imposed. It's why anti-Pope Paul VI, the totally demonic heretic, who promulgated the new Mass, confirmed the evil teachings of Vatican II, and attempted to remove the Catholic Mass from much of the world, is to be, quote, beatified. The new version of the pagan Roman Empire is at work right before our eyes in which the deceased pagan Roman kings, the anti-popes most responsible for the repaganization of Europe, are being honored along with false gods. The beast that was and is not has returned. The devil wants the images of these various anti-popes, not just John Paul II, to be honored because all of them exemplified wickedness. They all embraced heresy and false religions. They all served false gods. By honoring any of them as sanctified or blessed, one is professing that sanctification comes through wickedness. However, John Paul II's image, the image of the one who was wounded and claimed to be Jesus Christ, is the most significant. It's singled out in the Apocalypse because John Paul II served false gods and built temples for their worship most notoriously, and therefore the veneration of him constitutes the most immediate and direct connection to idolatry for the masses. So, if you think that in the future there will come seven Roman kings, as part of a new kingdom in Rome, with a new empire on the Mediterranean Sea, constituting a new version of the beast that was, arising when five of those kings are fallen, with one of those Roman kings being wounded, deceiving the world, and implicating the masses in idolatry through the veneration of his image, well, you're wrong. That's not coming in the future. It already happened and we are living through the final stage of it.